This is Wisdom Anime Recap. This means war. Under the cover of darkness, at an abandoned underground bar, a girl named Fujino Asagami endured a brutal assault at the hands of a street gang, her impassive expression hinting at dissociation. Mikia stumbled upon Fujino, crouched in an alley, her pain and distress evident but locked away in silence. He possessed an intuition of her agony, recognizing it as stomach pain, so he welcomed her to stay at his apartment for the night. Yet come dawn, Fujino vanished. Mikia readied himself for the day as he listened to the news reporting on a murder and dismemberment at an abandoned underground bar the night before. He confronted Toko at her office, censuring her for withholding his wages due to her extravagant spending on a Victorian Ouija board. Once he left, Toko assigned Shiki the task of capturing the suspected perpetrator of the murders at the underground bar, dead or alive. Shiki refused to look at the suspect's file, believing she would instantly recognize them, seeing herself and the suspect as murderers cut from the same cloth. At their college food court, Mikia's friend Gakudo asked him to track down Keita Minato, who was rumored to be in some sort of trouble. Meanwhile, Fujino dialed Keita's phone, the relentless ringing echoing in his paralyzed heart as he quivered in fear, refusing to answer. She went on to torture a man without laying hands on him in an interrogation for information on Keita's location, and when the man's knowledge proved useless, she ended his life. Later she met Mikia's sister Azaka over coffee, who chatted with her absent-mindedly until Fujino's distress became evident to her. Azaka offered solace, assuring her that her brother would find Keita. At that moment, Shiki materialized, carrying a message from Mikia, informing them that he wouldn't be able to meet them. Her eyes flashed with malevolence, seeking to awaken the dormant darkness within Fujino, yet Fujino remained unmoved, so Shiki withdrew, her suspicion lifted for the time being. Mikia spent the remainder of the day wandering through the streets in search of Keita. That night, Fujino interrogated another victim in pursuit of Keita's whereabouts. She twisted his limbs like corkscrews, without laying hands on him either, until she'd convinced herself of his ignorance. After snuffing out his life, she declared she never wished for this dark act, her words laden with an odd sincerity. Shiki emerged from the shadows, proclaiming her belief once more that they both were cut from the same cloth. Her eyes flashed with malevolence once more, this time successfully triggering Fujino's own. However, Shiki appeared disheartened by what she saw, departing with disappointment on her face. Fujino's mind drifted back to her childhood, a distant memory of a day when she played with a knife that had gotten mixed up with her toys, cutting her hand. Her mother rushed to treat her wound, but Fujino could not understand what was wrong, as the cut hadn't caused her pain. Yet tears of joy streamed down her face because her mother held her. Her ability to feel pain had been numbed by a congenital analgesia, which had somehow extended to her emotions as well. Although she truly regretted the lives she'd taken, murder had become her only way of feeling anything, even the agony of remorse or stomach pain. This was her only way of living some semblance of a normal life. Fujino dialed Keita's phone, this time with a chilling message, revealing she couldn't have Keita speaking to the authorities, meaning she had to finish what she started at the abandoned underground bar. Yet, it was Mikia who listened to her through Keita's phone, as he had finally found him. He listened to Keita's confession of he and his gang's crime, a vile routine they had perpetuated for six months. They had subjected Fujino to unimaginable horrors, her emotions always seeming void until one day, fairly recently, when they had struck her head with a bat. It was then that agony finally gripped her, and she became responsive, crying out when they abused her and reacting appropriately, until she finally followed through on her vengeance. Although Mikia's contempt for Keita was evident, he chose to bring him back to Toko's office for protection. Toko and Shiki disliked this, but they agreed to let him stay. They asked Mikia what he planned to do, so he explained he could only think to talk Fujino out of her revenge. Toko and Shiki deemed this decision foolish, yet Mikia believed that since revenge was her driving force, it should be possible to reason with her. So Mikia set out to investigate Fujino's past in order to exact a method of reason with her. While Mikia was absent, Toko's informant within the police force reached out to her. Fujino had claimed another victim the previous night, this time unrelated to her revenge. For this reason, Shiki recognized the need to stop Fujino and left Toko's office. Upon Mikia's return, he divulged what he had discovered during his absence. From a village doctor, he learned Fujino had been born with the ability to sense pain until her father numbed her with drugs to weaken her telekinetic powers out of fear of being ostracized. Ironically, this only served to intensify them. 
They stepped out into the downpour and drove to intercept Shiki before she could confront Fujino. Toko explained that Fujino was never stabbed to begin with. Her true torment stemmed from untreated appendicitis, followed by her appendix rupturing, which had gone untreated for five days, and accounted for the absence of any visible stab wound. In short, Fujino was dying. To make matters worse, her killing spree might have been curbed had she succeeded in completing her revenge by eliminating Keita. And yet, her father, the same man who had employed Toko in the first place, also wanted her dead. Fujino was now beyond the reach of salvation. On a shadowed bridge, Shiki confronted Fujino in a dance of darkness and death. Shiki's heart was tainted by a twisted pleasure in killing, though she always deemed her victims justified in her own mind. In contrast, Fujino's cold intent was merely a means to an end, but her once calculated strikes had grown chaotic and random. Their opposing natures clashed, entwining in a battle that spanned moments like eternity. In the grim struggle, Fujino's dreadful power twisted Shiki's left arm, rendering it useless. Yet a sliver of hope emerged for Shiki as she unlocked the secrets of Fujino's telekinesis through her mystic eyes. She saw its hidden cracks and occlusions, allowing her to thwart Fujino's attacks. But just as victory seemed within Shiki's grasp, Fujino unleashed her devastating power to bring down the bridge. The world crumbled around them, leaving Fujino wounded and agonizing, but her will to survive clung desperately to the threads of her manufactured normal life. Yet Shiki, with a swift motion of her blade, put an end to the agony that plagued her. Outside the wreckage, Mikia and Toko awaited Shiki, witnessing the aftermath of this fateful confrontation. Shiki revealed that, in the final moments, Fujino lost her sensitivity to pain, and with it, her desire to kill. Shiki used her eyes to cut through Fujino's illness, granting her a second chance at life. Toko promised her a new arm, one capable of grasping spirits to replace Shiki's mangled limb. Mikia called for an ambulance to tend to Fujino. In the dim hours that followed, Mikia bared his soul to Shiki, divulging a revelation about Fujino, who he perceived as ordinary beneath in spite of her darkness. Despite her malevolent deeds, he sensed a lingering remorse within her, which would forever torment her heart and besiege her mind. He deemed her more human than the criminals she had sought vengeance upon, and thus, he resolved to cast upon her a compassionate gaze, and disclosed his steadfast commitment to remain by Shiki's side for similar reasons. Shiki in turn confessed a peculiar emotion, a small, special, murderous intent lurking in the depths of her being, a twisted expression of her affection for him, entangled in her enigmatic psyche. That night, Mikia arrived at Shiki's apartment, bearing a decadent gift of strawberry ice cream. Yet the shadows that draped her expression betrayed a heart far from joyous at his arrival. Undeterred, Mikia spoke of how the strawberry flavor, red like her leather jacket, resonated within him. Though to most, strawberries were simply beautiful, he recognized their relation to roses, a beauty even more profound, a beauty he saw mirrored in Shiki. Yet, she stowed the ice cream away in the freezer, unmoved by Mikia's words. At Toko's office, Shiki and Toko discussed a series of eerie suicide incidents involving high school girls. Their deaths were perplexing, as the girls had plunged to their demise without leaving behind any suicide notes or displaying signs of distress beforehand. Such departures contrasted with typical suicides by jumping, which often sought to draw attention to one's death, a practice unusual to those seeking a discreet end, like those who left no suicide letters. Toko concluded that the girls had not meant to die. Mikia lay unconscious on the couch, an unknowing spectator of the unfolding mysteries. That night, Shiki ventured into the forsaken part of town, a place haunted by the decaying Fujo buildings, destined for demolition. Amidst the crumbling ruins, she discovered the remains of the latest victim, as well as a swarm of ghostly figures hovering above. The next day, Shiki shared her unsettling findings with Toko, now convinced of the unnaturalness surrounding these suicides. She recounted the sight of the ghostly figures, eight in total, intuiting that the suicides would cease at this number. Toko surmised that these figures were more than mere ghosts. They were recordings and memories of the departed, trapped in an imperfect pocket of time that surrounded the Fujo buildings, defying their natural dissipation into the world. That evening, Shiki raced to stop the seventh victim from jumping, only to find she had arrived too late. She resolved to infiltrate the Fujo buildings, shrouded in Twilight's veil. Cutting through the police tape, she ascended the stairs as unsettling echoes of a girl's laughter haunted her every step. 
A figure materialized, lashing out at Shiki with deadly intent, aiming to attack her with her own blade, causing Shiki to stumble. The apparition took control of her puppet arm, attempting to strangle her with her own limb. Drawing upon her mystic eyes, Shiki severed her puppet arm. In turn, the ghost dissolved into the shadows. Shiki entrusted her wounded puppet arm to Toko for repairs, who urged her to tread more carefully and recounted the day she had hired Mikia. He had located her office without any initial information on her, and in spite of the magical barrier she'd placed over it to repel people. Their chance meeting at a doll exhibition, where Mikia encountered a doll resembling Shiki, had ignited his curiosity, leading him on a quest to find its creator. Toko speculated that the doll had stirred something within Mikia, resonating with the void he sensed within Shiki, a void he wished to fulfill. Shiki beheld Mikia, still lying unconscious on the couch, in a new light, perceiving him with deeper understanding and perhaps even a flicker of emotion. Shiki returned home, finding solace in the strawberry ice cream Mikia had brought for her. Reminiscing on his countless acts of compassion she had once rejected, she realized the depth of her yearning for connection and the struggle to embrace the love that had always been within her grasp. The next day, having reclaimed her new and improved puppet arm, Shiki braved the rain, returning to the ominous Fujo buildings and ascending to the rooftop on the dimly lit elevator. Beneath the pale moon's glow, the ghostly forms of the eight apparitions materialized. With a swift and deadly grace, she sliced through the apparitions one by one, guided by her mystic eyes of death perception. The last remaining spirit, the leader, using her powers of suggestion, tempted her to leap off the edge. Yet Shiki was impervious to her wicked influence, as no desire for death ever tainted her soul, for human emotion eluded her, so suffering found no refuge in her heart. She hurled her blade toward the spirit, sending her hurtling off the rooftop, where she dissolved into a cascade of white petals, never reaching the ground. Kiri Fujo awoke in her hospital bed, her physical form now severed from her spiritual body. Toko entered the room, inquiring why she had taken so many lives. Fujo recounted the endless days spent in this hospital room, gazing eternally at the unchanging skyline through the window, a sight that persisted even when blindness befell her. Shiki's eradication of her spiritual body caused the skyline to vanish, leaving her with only this sickly body. Her intentions had been pure, merely seeking friendship with the seven girls. But when she called out to them, they remained blind to her presence. So she tempted them off the edge, where they could join her in their spiritual bodies. Fujo disclosed how she had seen Mikia routinely bring flowers to Shiki during her hospital stay, and how she yearned for the same devotion. She was keeping him in a suspended state, ensnared by her powers for her exclusive possession. Toko advised her to live her life, not driven by remorse and hopeless longing, but to walk the best path she could in her condition. Regrettably, once Toko left, Fujo fixated on the instant of her spiritual body's death when she felt more alive than ever before. She craved to relive that sensation, even if it could only be an approximation. In her wheelchair, she ascended to the rooftop of the Fujo buildings, where she chose to end her life, becoming the eighth and final victim. And so, Mikia finally awoke at Toko's office, where they watched a haunting news report confirming that Fujo had done what Toko had asked her not to. As Mikia and Shiki made their way home, Shiki asked about his opinion on suicide. Mikia presented a hypothetical scenario in which he would be compelled to martyr himself for the sake of humanity. Despite his willingness to make such a sacrifice, he regarded suicide as a cowardly act, regardless of the circumstances. In response, Shiki rebuffed his answer, assuring him that she saw no semblance of cowardice within him. Her words wrapped his heart in a profound warmth, as it was clear she wanted to believe in his strength to endure, forever standing by her side through any adversity. Upon reaching her apartment, Mikia recounted a dream, one that mirrored Fujo's story. In the dream, Fujo was a butterfly, chasing after a dragonfly until she had exhausted herself. She could have simply floated in place, embracing her destiny as a butterfly. However, she now knew what it was like to fly, so in distress, she chose to fall to the ground instead. Shiki invited Mikia to spend the night. Perplexed by her sudden desire for his company, he sought an explanation, only for her to deflect his question by requesting him to hand her the once-rejected strawberry ice cream. 